Okay. I did this uh, keynote yesterday, and uh, I thought I thought it went really well, so I thought I would do it again. Uh, I already shared the the um, already shared the slides, but I thought I would put up the, the video. So this is um, I was asked to do a talk on the hidden curriculum about being an economist, the things they don't teach you, and I decided to do it about <clears throat> about just kind of the psychological emotional things uh in the profession that you know we don't talk about that kind of feed into our lives uh, we'll just summarize in our mental health and success so what i'm going to do is i'm going to give a different definition of success that i think all of us myself especially should consider i'm going to discuss some of those um, hidden struggles and i'm going to discuss the hidden tools that i think could help you manage you know, success as well as your mental health and discuss some of the ways that I think you might be able to be happy with it while working in a fairly competitive environment. <clears throat> so let me talk about mental health. This is a poem by an early 20th century poet named Stevie Smith, uh, not waving but drowning. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much further out than you thought and not waving but drowning. Poor chap. He always loved larking, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, no, no. It was too cold always. Still the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. This is a really, it's one of my favorite poems. It's really short and tells a story, and it's a really kind of, unusual story it's a dead man and he's not dead he's talking but somehow he's also has drowned <clears throat> and i think you can see what's going on is that it's a story about misunderstanding it's a story about a person uh out at sea not so far that that you can't see him from the shoreline and he's bobbing up and down waving to the people on the shoreline and the people on the shoreline are waving back and uh, he is not waving to say hello, and he is not being jovial. He's dying. Uh, he's dying right in front of people's eyes. And in fact, he does die. And even when he dies, the people on the shore still don't understand what happened. They don't understand that it wasn't because the water was too cold. It wasn't because his heart gave way. It was because right in front of them, the whole time, he had always been begging and pleading for someone to pay attention to what a hard time he was having. Now, what I want to start off and say is, and I'm going to give some statistics on this, a lot of our classmates, a lot of our students, a lot of our colleagues, junior and higher up faculty, they are struggling. They are having a very hard time. They are having a hard time because of the environment of economics or they are having a hard time for reasons that have nothing to do with economics. And we have got to pay attention. We have got to look and be more curious about why they're waving. So this is uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. It was a study um, of PhD students, postgraduate students. And here are, uh, <clears throat> Here is a breakdown of the mental health anxiety, mental health struggles that they're having during their PhD. They're struggling from imposter syndrome. All of these are like, you know, a horrible production function that produces just misery. And one of them is imposter syndrome. Very common, uh, most common in among women and underrepresented minorities, basically a feeling of, that you don't deserve to be there, even though that's absurd because uh, by virtue of being there, you show that you have been identified as someone that is believed to be, uh, who would benefit in life uh, from being in that career and vice versa. Many of them, this is the first time they've ever failed anything. Uh, I um, <laughs> did not struggle with this problem in graduate school. I was, uh, God, what was I? 2.5 GPA high school, a 3.0 GPA college. 
I was really good at failing. Um, it did not bother me at all to fail. Uh, but some it does. You know, I had classmates that um, had been the smartest people in every class that they had ever been in, and they were getting Fs. And so that can cause, that can be so jarring and so difficult that it contributes to the struggle that you're having. Uh, you can have trouble with maintaining work-life balance. That one has definitely been a struggle for me. You can have tough relationships. Uh, people can, um, ha I heard a story once of a student who uh, had been, he was a theorist and he'd been working on this problem for months <clears throat> and he could not solve it. You know, and he would tell me about it, but I was like, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> and so he showed it to his advisor really smart game theorist and the advisor went home as he told it laid in his bathtub solved the problem brought it in on Monday and the student was devastated the student was like this was my dissertation and you just did it and then and the the supervisor said um, what did he say he said uh, if you use this uh, what I've just done I will sue you for for violating my intellectual property so he said to the student and then shortly thereafter, the student quit and started flipping homes. This, this, this was a good example of a difficult supervisor-student relationship to navigate. Right? I'm not even throwing this supervisor under the bus. This is clearly a hard relationship to navigate. And there's different versions of this. You have absent supervisors, you have overbearing ones, you have micromanagers, you have ones who are uh, behaving inappropriately, and it can just cause, it can be really hard to manage those relationships. Many of them uh, are, are uh, having trouble moving from classwork to research. You know, you would see that too. You probably have seen that. Some people are unbelievable uh, in class, and then they just stall. They have such a hard time at research levels it's a different you know part of the brain anybody can do it but it can be really it, it can be something that maybe you're not as strong in as you were in classwork and that can create some struggles you can have financial concerns it might be way too competitive um, it might be that you just feel like you can't write the right papers you can't get the papers out uh, you can't find the data set you can't find the identification strategy every idea you have just keeps blowing up in your face you can be by yourself a lot and worst of all uh, academics will justify these struggles and say that it is normal it's part of the journey and it does not have to be so i have this paper that was just uh, accepted at uh, scientific reports and we found doing a meta review uh, 24 percent of all phd students suffer from clinically significant symptoms of depression 17 percent suffer from anxiety a really beautiful study done uh, back in, I think it was 2018, by a team at Harvard uh, that studied just econ PhD students. 18% of graduate students experience moderate or severe depression and anxiety, which is three times the population average. 11% report suicidal ideation in a two week period. The average PhD student reports more loneliness than a retired American. Only a quarter feel that their work matters versus 70% of faculty and many of them are not in treatment. This is a, uh, uh, this is a, what is it? Ted Lasso comes back after uh, his divorce and says, um, it can be a sad, work can be a sad and lonely place. And, um, you know, this is the, this is the situation for many people. You look around the room and, and many people in the room are, are gonna be like this. And this is something for us to remember. Maybe you're from a lower ranked university and you don't feel like you're in the club. How do you get ahead? I, I, I really identify with that. Early on, that was how I felt. I felt so, such an intense insecurity because I didn't have the pedigree um, and I wasn't at a big school. Uh, and so the, I don't know if it was imposter syndrome and I don't struggle with it now. Now I, I am genuinely indifferent to all that stuff. But for a long time, I really, it was hard. And the thing I want to emphasize to you is this imposter syndrome. I want to make a distinction uh, for you. There are things that are real and there are things that are true. Imposter syndrome is real, but it is not true. R real means that you feel it. You feel those things. 
And therefore, if you feel it, you have to validate it. You have your friends have to validate it. You need to validate it in other people. You need to listen and you need to empathize. You need to not argue with them and you just need to be there in that pain with them. Okay. But it's not true. True means it reflects something concrete in the world, something outside of your feelings, right? If you're an amputee, it is both real that you feel like you're missing out on certain things because you're missing legs. And the truth is you are missing out on certain things because you're missing your legs. You are missing out on certain kinds of athletic activities and you're missing out on the ability to move from point A to point B without experiencing some discomfort. So uh, imposter syndrome is not true. It is a story. It is a story that you tell yourself about who you are and how you fit into this world. And all stories actually, and hear me out, all stories, no matter what they are, about yourself or about the world are false, but some of them are useful. And if imposter syndrome helped you get from point A to point B, then we could say it's useful and actually celebrate it for its, its, its usefulness, but it doesn't. It's all about slowing you down. It's all about beating you up. And if it's doing that, and your goals are to get from point A to point B and it's making it harder to get to point B, then it is not useful. And therefore you have got to ignore it. You have got to figure out a way to absolutely ignore those voices because they are not true. First of all, they are not true because no stories are true. And this one is annoying. So a lot of these things are just insecurities and they may be new insecurities that have come up because you're in a new part of life. If I left academia, and went and got a job in industry, I'm sure I would start to feel flare-ups of imposter syndrome again. I'm sure of it. Because just simply the jostling and the changing of the equilibrium can bring these things up. But they're not real. They're not real characteristics about you. They're not true. So don't let others tell you who you are and who you are not. If this is coming from somebody else, get better at just letting this stuff slide. You know? Think about Ted Lasso um, in that scene where he benches Jamie Tart. I've always thought this was interesting. He benches Jamie Tart, and the whole crowd is screaming at him, wanker, you don't understand what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. They know more about football than him. Absolutely, they do. But watch what Ted does. What does he do? He does not defend himself, and he does not justify his choice. He does not argue with the crowd. He almost has this benevolent distractedness about him. Like he doesn't even notice what they're saying. That's kind of the goal. The goal is not to have this hatefulness towards other people that judge you. The goal is really to not hear it. So you've got to believe in yourself. You have to have confidence. It's it's true. It sounds it sounds like something we heard growing up and and have just gotten to a point where we don't believe it anymore, but it's true. You have to believe in yourself, okay? Believe in yourself. I'm depressed. I'm having a hard time passing my prelims. I can't find a good advisor. I feel like quitting. That Those are hard feelings. And those are those could very well be true, right? Those aren't just real. Those can be true. You could be having a hard time passing your prelims. You could be having a hard time finding a good advisor, you're not the only one that feels that way. For whatever that's worth, you, there are other people that feel that way. It's actually a quite common experience. I don't even think it's just an econ experience. I think it's a, probably a very common postgraduate PhD experience. The thing to remember is that advisor-advisee relationship is a marriage. And there's good marriages and there's bad marriages. And there's search costs to finding that partner there's uncertainty about whether or not a fit is going to work well and you have a limited number of possibilities and unfortunately whereas you can break up with people in the dating market it's incredibly costly to do that in your advisor advisee relationship because there can be reputational concerns because you think there's going to be okay so this is this is hard for sure so what can i say to this first Continue to be curious. Continue to cultivate curiosity around you. Be curious about who your advisor is. He or she is her own person. Uh, be curious about who they are, right? Don't be judgmental. 
Just listen and observe. Have fortitude. Don't give up. You're at a bad part of the race, no doubt. You're on the marathon. You're at, you're at, you're at mile 18. Your legs are giving out. It's 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 normal. Okay, slow down. Wait till you get your second win, and then just run a little bit. Keep going. All you got to do is just keep going. Okay, it will end. Of course, you can always leave too. I want to be clear about that. It's always an option to leave. It's always an option to step off the track. Even even marathon runners. Elite marathon runners will step off to avoid getting injured. Okay, so it's not, there's no shame in deciding at some point I'm I want to go somewhere else. It's not for everybody. Okay, uh, and I don't mean that in like a, a bad way. I just mean it's literally not. It's not necessarily something everybody should do. I do think it's a great job. I do think that if you are wanting it, you know, some of these things apply. Even even if you are wanting it. In the meantime, find a healthy community. Find a healthy community that you can be a part of. Be a part of a community. A community is a group of people who meet regularly with a common goal and allow themselves to be known and know other people. Okay? They give to each other and they allow gifts to be given to them. That's a community. Find a healthy one. It doesn't have to be academic. It doesn't have to be religious. It, doesn't, it could be athletic. It could be anything. It could be a book club. Consider getting a therapist. Consider getting a life coach. Talk to me. I'll give you the name of my life coach. Make sure you're exercising. Make sure you're you're taking care of the things you can control. You can control your exercise. You can control your diet. You can control your sleep. I don't mean losing weight. I just mean being active. All of these things, all of these things can help, even if they are not, don't seem to be relevant. Another thing I want to put in your mind is um, you know, is, is citizenship and service. P public goods and service are part of being in community with people. Some people, and we're in community as economists. We're in a community with each other. That community could be the AEA, could be your department, okay? Could be your region, could be your field. Some people in the community want to be leaders. They want to be editors. They, they have things in mind, and that's good. That, that's great that they want to do that. It's not for everybody, but it is good to do that because those things are needed. But just because it's an equilibrium, all right, just because it's an equilibrium, it doesn't mean it's the only option available to you. I firmly believe that there are public good market failures everywhere, okay? Alec, when it's time, you know, in an appropriate at an appropriate time in your life, although I think, you know, this can be smaller when you're a graduate student and junior, and it can get bigger as you get full. Allocate your time, all right, where the social marginal benefits of that activity are greater than your marginal costs or the social marginal costs, because those are the public goods that are missing, right? The things where the social marginal benefits are greater than the social marginal costs are those missing activities that are valued more. Provide them. Be entrepreneurial, be innovative, have fun, do things for others that bring value to the community, right? Not to get rewards for yourself, not to get popularity, just do it. Because lots of times, simply being in the activity of giving and compassion can just help with these negative feelings. It, it, it's strange, but it can. One is it can build relationships. It can have, it can help you get out of your head. So I started the AEA 5K with Daniel Bergstrom and we just did it because we just thought it'd be fun. I just thought it'd be fun to make a t-shirt. I just love the t-shirts. I love making jokes. Um, I love seeing everybody having a great time. There's all these great runners. I like, you know, coming up with the um, medals and stuff like that and the, and the weird prizes. Coachella. You know, I, I did Coachella again because I love T-shirts. I love making these shirts. I, I love T-shirts. I remember this one time I was at the, I was with this really, uh, I was with this guy at lunch and, and, and uh, he was like this lawyer and I, and I saw the T-shirt at the, at the restaurant. And I was like, boy, I like that restaurant. I like that T-shirt. He got it for me. And I was like, I was like, thanks for getting this T-shirt. I really needed to diversify my wardrobe because it was like a blue one, you know, with like a weird cartoon character on it. He was like, this is diversifying. And I was like, well, yeah, I don't have one like this. And he's like, yeah, that's, I think it, I think diversification means something else. So, you know, uh, 
I don't even know what I was talking about that, but you know, do, doing, doing things, uh, my sub stack, uh, I do it to invest in my human capital. I also do it because I think to myself, I might have the ability to provide a small step to help somebody get to a paper, right? I might be able to provide a small step, just a little bit of a stepping stone to get to another paper, uh, mentorship, you know, being in somebody's life, just being alongside them, those things, those things help. They don't think they would, but they do help. Okay. Be the thing in the profession. If you think something is missing, be that thing. Okay. Sometimes you have hardships happen. And if you could think about it this way, even though this is just a metaphor, if you could think about it as how much would I be willing to pay to have avoided experiencing that hardship? Maybe it's $10,000. You would have been willing to pay $10,000 so as to not feel those feelings and go through that hardship in graduate school. An inspired action is something that creates value that you care about, right? It's, it's, it's value that you care about too. And the willingness to pay for that value, that valuable good or service that you have created, it just has to be $1 more than the cost of the hardship. And if you do that consistently over your life, you will be redeeming these hardships. You will redeem them. You know, the AEA 5K was like that for me. It had nothing to do with this difficult time in my life, but that was my fo my focus. I thought I will make this other thing. I will spend time on it and it, it will be bigger than the hard, rough times I've had. Success. What is success? Ted Lasso, when he's uh, being interviewed by uh, uh, Trent, is it Trent Krem? Trent Krem from The Independent. He says, um, he says to Trent, uh, I don't really concern myself with wins and losses. And Trent says, I'm definitely going to use that in my story. I don't really concern myself with wins and losses. That is the exact opposite. <laughs> that is that is 100% the exact opposite of how most economists think. They concern themselves with wins and losses. They count up the papers on their Vita. And they're either good papers or they're bad papers. They're either good hits or they're bad hits. They either have a good job or they have a bad job. They're either in the NBR or they're not in the NBR. Uh, I want to put a different idea of success out there. Success is a peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing that you did your best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. That's John Wooden, UCLA's most winningest basketball coach in its history. Uh, I got that, of course, from Ted Lasso. I'll show you in the next, the next slide. What is success? This other alternative version of success. This is what's crazy, right? John Wooden would be focused on wins and losses, right? So if, so if John Wooden said success is winning the most games, I mean, honestly, I would be like, yeah, that's right. It is about winning the most games. That's That's got to be right. He, he And the proof is in the pudding. He doesn't say that. He says it's a peace of mind. Okay, it's it's a it's a subjective mental space. It's a subjective tranquility in your heart and your mind. And it comes from a self satisfaction that nobody else can give you that you give yourself. And it comes from knowing that you did your best, knowing that you did your best. That's all you can ever do. All you can do in graduate school is do your best. And if you did your best and you had the self-satisfaction of knowing that you did your best, you were successful. Okay? Ted Lasso says in, a, in an interview after that uh, game where he benches Jamie Tart, and a newspaper reporter in the next episode asks, how's it feel to win your first game? And he goes, well, sometimes you can have, uh, sometimes you can win and not have, you, sometimes you can have the most points and not win, and sometimes you can have the least points and win. And this time we had both. Sometimes, sometimes in life, maybe even a lot, you will not have the most points and you will be successful. And you have got to cultivate the ability to recognize that so that you have the self-satisfaction because all of those things are inputs in a long production function that produces peace of mind. And that is what success is, okay? So success requires knowing you did your best. That means you've got to know if that's true or not. That means reflection, all right? Your potential is endogenous, all right? You think about potential output. Potential output is not exogenous. Potential output is a function of human capital, physical capital, technology, um, 
you know, savings and investments. It's a function of all the inputs that goes into GDP and the potential of the country, the potential of some economy to produce something is endogenous. But here you are that thing. It's your, your potential is a function of hard work, practice, training. You're going to need rest. You're going to need mentorship. You're going to need supportive relationships. You've got to pay attention. You've got to learn from your mistakes. You're about to find the right counterfactual. I used to really uh, look up to, and I, I still do, I still look up to Mark Hookstra at A&M a lot. Early on, he, we were in the same cohort, um, and uh, I remember shaking his hand the first time I met him at this elevator. I'm sure he doesn't remember this. We were at the ASSA, and I swear to God, I thought he crushed every freaking bone in my hand. He's, he's, one, of these, he's one of these hard handshake guys, you know, these guys, like they... It's like they can't even help it. It's like Superman's, you know, uh, Superman had to learn the skill not to break people's hands when he shook their hands because he didn't even know he was doing it. That's Mark. And um, Mark just hit the ground running. I did not hit the ground running, but he did. And I used to really compare myself to Mark. And there's a sense in which that's good because you kind of have role models and you look up to people and you're sort of thinking about why, you know, you're trying to like, you've just kind of got this messy room and you're looking at what other people are doing when they're clean and you're like, oh, this goes there. This, this goes in the hamper. I didn't, I never, I never thought about that. I never thought about getting this plastic um, container and putting some of this junk in there, right? So it's good to look at other people and to have, you know, role models to help you reframe yourself. But there's also a point where that is not what you're doing. Okay, when you're not just observing and learning from someone else. And that is where you look at their production possibility frontier and think that it is yours, right? That is their production possibility frontier. It is a function of their talent, their situation, their background, their experience. That is not yours, all right? You got to where you are the long way, okay? There's no harm, there's no shame in that. So do not judge yourself based on someone else's PPF, okay? It is unfair to yourself and it is toxic, to be completely honest. It will cause you to both be miserable and it will cause you to not appreciate that other person's contributions to the world. You won't like their papers. You won't like their success. You won't be able to celebrate their success. You can't do interperson comparisons. You've, success is all about intraperson comparisons. It's about your current self and your potential self. It's about those research output gaps, those teaching output gaps. You think about how we teach um, recessions, right? It's about counterfactuals. What is output? What could it be? Not, not comparing the United States to England or not comparing another country to something else. Comparing it to your own counterfactual right? So it's just about you. It's not about Mark. And the thing is, you know, and this, I didn't, this didn't know where to put this, but, but, but the other thing is to be prepared. Luck favors the prepared. Be ready. And then when the good luck comes along, you know how to capture it. Just trust in the karma of things. Trust that the good fortune will come your way. It will. It is like a Halley's Comet. This stuff does come back around. Be ready for it. Okay. This is John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. Coach Beard puts this on the wall in the first episode of Ted Lasso. A lot of the pictures on the wall actually are kind of surprising. There's one of, uh, what's the guy's name that knocked out Mike Tyson? Buster, something. Yeah, I love that. I love that, right? Usually, usually the, I mean, of course, there's that Muhammad Ali picture. God, that Muhammad Ali photograph is unreal. I cannot even believe that guy got that photograph. But then there's these other ones. And there's this one right here. And this is this is Ted Lasso's philosophy. You can tell because once you watch the show and you look at this, you realize it's the same thing. Here's here is the inputs, you know, that it, forget that they're like they look ranked. You know, my friend Casey Buckle, she was like the, the way that it's presented makes you think that the bottom row is necessary for the top one. Forget that. OK, just think about it as like a 12 input production function to be successful. You must work hard, industriousness. You must have friendship. You have to be a good friend on those projects. You have to show up when it's time for you to show up. You've got to be loyal to your co-authors. You've got to uh, be cooperative. Don't try to be a bully and make it be that we're doing it your way. Make Try to make the goal to do it the best way, not in having your way. Be enthusiastic. It brushes off. Negativity brushes off. A lot of this stuff has externalities, appear effects. 
control yourself, learn to control your emotions, have cultivate good judgment and common sense, be alert, observe, be curious, be open-minded. All right. Don't be the guy whose mind has become a trap. Stay open-minded. All these things, all these things are at least a model of success. Okay. That I want you to just consider, right? As things that you might try to invest in. You might try to invest in this. All right. What about the faculty? How can you promote your student success? I, I've seen departments and I've seen people in departments where they are truly indifferent to the success of their students. And the reason might be because they were in a department that was modeled that way and they became successful. But the thing, and so they think that it works. And uh, all of us have bits of that in us um, because we're not, you know, like geniuses. We can't, we can't, we can't act like we didn't have experiences happen and not draw inadvertently causal effects, right? That's kind of what that's talking about. But remember, this is selection on the dependent variable. There's survivor bias. We're not observing the ones who dropped out in those environments. Don't forget the metaphor of the leaky pipeline, okay? Our goal as faculty should be to create successful economists. And here we have success. For students who have the peace of mind that comes from knowing, from the self-satisfaction of knowing that they did their best to become the best that they're capable of becoming. It is ultimately success is in the mind of the student. But we can help by creating a model and a culture that creates mutual respect and support for one another does not mean at all withholding criticism. You can hold students to high standards. You can validate them. You can believe in them. You can invest in them and you can expect them to succeed. That's what I remember Mark saying one time to me. He said, hold the students to high standards and believe that they will meet them. Yeah, I mean, all these people I know that have, like, are really good at this, it's not a coincidence they like played competitive sports growing up because this is built into the model of teamwork. I think of Ted Lasso as a model. Building team environments can help students achieve their potential. And frankly, it can do it while reducing costs because at some point when it becomes to work, when it starts to work, they're helping each other. The students are loving each other and allowing themselves to be loved. So be a mentor and be a professor, but be yourself. Again, it's about you being yourself. Don't be someone else, but be curious and be observant. If you're a student or if you're a junior faculty, one of the things that was in this John Wooden deal right here was ambition. It's good to be ambitious, all right? Make realistic, ambitious, and virtuous goals. Have a one-year, five-year, ten-year plan. One-year plan. What do you want to be doing in a year? All right? Where do you want to be in a year? That's a goal. I want to run a marathon in one year. That's what I did. So I trained. Why did I want to run a marathon? I had never known anyone that had run a marathon when I ran. I, ran, I knew one guy. I knew one guy. Matt. Matt Polk. No, I knew a couple. Actually, I did know a few people. But the people I knew that ran marathons... I thought to myself, that was impossible. That's like climbing Mount Everest. I, I couldn't even believe. I mean, now it's like really common for people to run marathons. But when I was younger, I didn't know anybody that had ever done one. Well, why was that important to me? Why was it important to me to have done something I had never done? And as I, you know, and, and here's the thing. If you keep asking those why questions, why is that important? Why, okay, you, you answer it. Why is that important? You answer that. Why is that important? You get down to these core root things, you can start to figure out if those values are good and virtuous values in the first place, right? Some stuff is driven by grotesque things that you would be better off deleting. Highlight, delete, okay? But once you've decided that this is a value, that is who you are, that this is who you are and this is what you believe in and you wanna build a goal off of that, then you plan. You figure out what are the, net, what are the steps necessary to reach that goal having it for one year, five year, 10 year plans and really aiming for ambitious things. That's awesome. Frankly, that is awesome. It can be tenure. It can be more than tenure. It can be something, it can be something truly big. All right. So long as it comes out of a virtuous value, oh, it's great. Let me talk about social media. 
I heard that tweets can increase my academic success. Is this true? It's actually, uh, the results are a little mixed. So there's been several RCTs done on this and the results are a little mixed. One study I found a uh, journal of thoracic, thorac surgery uh, found uh, three additional, two and a half additional sites per year. The control group had a baseline site of 0.5 sites. The treatment group of these, you know, randomly tweeted um, papers had two and a half additional sites. It was a paper by uh, David McKenzie and Burke Osler back in 2011. They did blog mentions on large platforms, Freakonomics, Marginal Revolutions, Chris Blattman's blog. And they found really large increases in abstract views, but teeny tiny changes in click-throughs, one to two percent. Almost no change in the actual read. It, it, even then, that's just simply click-through. You don't even know if they read it. How many papers do I have on my desktop that I've never read? Maggio et al. finds a very small positive effect of tweeting on page views, no effect on downloads. So, you know, there's probably some inequality here. Some things that are getting uh, tweeted about are, you know, like MBR, self-selected, and so forth. But here's the thing I want to tell you. You can't control this, okay? You can't control whether or not people are tweeting about your work. So don't care. Anything that you can't control, there is, there is a point. There has got to be a point in your life where you accept the things that you cannot control and you do not lose sleep over it. It's a form of the sunk cost fallacy to be obsessed over things that you can't control. And we all, we all struggle with it, or I do. I struggle with it, not like in this area, but in other areas of my life. Just focus on the stuff you can control. You can control your best work, doing your best work. You can control remembering why you got into this, keeping that front of mind. Remember what's important in your life. Meaning, happiness, intellectual hedonism, relationships. Those are the things that matter, right? That's, what, that's what's important. The love of learning, the love of discovery, the love of writing a wonderful paper. We're, we're just people, okay? But here's what you might consider. If it is true that tweets improve academic success, why don't you do it yourself for other people? Consider promoting other people's work and just trust the karma because this gets back to that citizenship and that service and that compassion. If you can consider promoting other people's work, it can actually help address some of that. Just it, it, can, it can weirdly enough just help with some of those struggles that you may be feeling by just doing it for someone else and not asking for anything in return, okay? Doing unconditional love is a way of addressing some of this loneliness and emptiness you might feel. And if you do it all the time and it becomes your philosophy of life, it can help. Every time I get on social media, I get stressed out though. Do I need to be on it? No. You shouldn't be doing things that make you stressed out unless they are essential to those goals that you made, okay? I have friends who are extremely successful. They do not use social media at all. Many find it to be far too toxic an environment or they just think, it's stupid or it's just not a good fit. Uh, I am on social media. I have been a part of online communities since I was in the eighth grade. I'm 45 years old, so that was about 30 years ago. I have always been a part, except for a short break in high school. Uh, I have always been a part of online communities. Why? I don't know. I don't know why. I ran a bulletin board service back in, uh, in the eighth grade. There was this hacker bulletin board service. I did blogs. I was a part of, you know, forums. Uh, I made Facebook my uh, diary. You know, I've always lived, I'm a writer and I've always lived my life in a kind of writing public way. It's just, it's just the most natural thing for me. Um, it's not for others. Okay. So uh, just, you know, know yourself, but here's the deal at the same time. All right. You said, you said you get on social media, you get stressed out, right? The exact same time. Working through anxiety is a good skill, okay? So if it is part of your goals to be on social media and you hate it, maybe you don't get on, maybe you learn the skills of sitting in distressful feelings, right? Do not be afraid. One of the things, one of the skills you might learn is, I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna be afraid of people. I'm not gonna have an opinion. I'm not gonna be afraid of people having opinions about me. I'm not gonna be afraid of cancellation, okay? Don't be afraid of those things. They're not real, right? You know who you are. You don't need people. People do not tell you who you are. You know who you are, all right? And they're one of the reasons to be online, one of the reasons to be online 
frankly, this might be the, the biggest, most important reason is if you can find a community. If you can find a community. I found a community on Twitter. Andrew Baker, all right? Ite Share, Leah Bustan, Scott Emberman. I have made friends. Uh, and I every day look forward to talking to them. You know, I probably spend too much time, you know, joking around with them, but I, I, it's, they're, they're my friends. Well, people find friends all over the place, okay? So you don't need to find it there. Ultimately, your happiness, though, is the most important thing. And don't forget the definition of success. Let's talk about economics. There is a hierarchy in economics. It is different from every other social science. And we know that because it's been studied by people from an organizational perspective. And frankly, in my, my, in my opinion, it is pretty horrible. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the superiority complex that economists have. I'm talking about how insular the profession is, how, in, how the, the citations are not symmetric. We don't cite other fields. I'm talking about this like, you know, vi steep gradient of hierarchy, uh, of pedigree and memberships and things. Um, what's so bad about all that though? Well, it can cause extreme insecurity. It can cause depression. If you're not inside that hierarchical stream, uh, it can cause backbiting. It can cause gossip, jealousy. It can make you become somebody that you don't like. How do you live inside something so toxic? You, you need to be in it, but not of it. Okay. You need to be inside it, but it does not need to be you. So don't let your values get gradually replaced by values that you don't want, all right? Don't let your values get replaced. Any value that you have inside your life right now, you chose it. Don't pretend that you didn't, all right? You did chose it. You may have chose it because you weren't paying attention and it just got kind of uploaded to your brain like, like in the matrix, all right? Don't let that happen. If you don't want those values, you've got to be vigilant. Remember again why you got into this job, why you got into it. Try to minimize your time with toxic people. Find good, loving, supportive people. Honestly, you know, it's not your job to fix people. Find good, loving, supportive people. Let yourself be known and know other people. Try to ignore the merit badges that the AEA hands out that does it without really paying attention by cultivating a lot of positive, virtuous values. Those things become these weapons. Uh, that we kill ourselves with, all right? I find there's a lot of fighting with economics that I find distressing. Is it real or is it banner? Well, yes, ain't, uh, yes. <laughs> Some of it is real. Uh, there are intra-subfield fights, randomization versus structural work, Angus Deaton and Hito Embens, credibility revolution, right? Critique of papers, you know, David Newmark and uh, David Card and uh, Alan Kruger arguing over what the effect, what the what the the effect of minimum wages are on employment. Al Bowie's uh, critique of Derone Samoglu's uh, colonial mortality paper, right? Uh, Jesse Rothstein and Carolyn Hawksby. These are real, important parts of science. The critique of papers, the critique of ideas. Okay. Sometimes you'll see arguments and they're just banner. They're part of that distressing thing that you see. Econ Twitter is like that. There's a lot of just stupid, there's a lot of just half joking arguments on there all day. They're just water cooler arguments. There's arguments over lunch, okay? Just just be be respectful and be curious when you see that stuff. Don't be judgmental, just, just listen and observe, all right? But some of it, you're right. Some of it is toxic and it's driven by toxic people, just like in every field, okay? Um, just remember, nobody can tell you who you are unless you let them. Economists think that they're the smartest people in the room. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. And even when they're not, they still think they are. All right. So one of the things that I think we, you know, that is missing in the hierarchy of economics is just humility and humanity. It just tends to be undervalued, but you can do it. That's fine. You, you, just because it's missing there doesn't mean it has to be missing in you. Find a way to recover that humility. and find that Humility is not an uh, antithesis of learning and success. No, it is not at all. It's living in reality. It's living in reality. And living in reality is allows you to know where you are in space so that you can get where you're going. But know who you are and honestly know that you are perfectly good right now the way that you are research and tenure. I have an interesting question, but I don't have a clean exogenous experiment. What do I do? 
The pillars of science in my mind are description, causality, and theory. And don't let anybody tell you different that any of those three are not an important part of science. Okay? You don't have a clean exogenous experiment. Maybe it's a descriptive paper. Descriptive papers are critical. They are important. It is true. They are hard to publish, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. In my research early on, I published a lot of descriptive papers because I didn't know the thing I was studying. I was studying sex work and it was internet mediated sex work. There, I was an early mover on that and uh, I didn't know there wasn't anybody to read. So I would collect new data sets and I would just describe the data sets. One of my favorite papers with Todd Kendall is just purely descriptive. Um, Cause you're, anytime you have a new phenomenon, it requires description. Anytime you got a new data set, it requires description. Really what you need to do is kind of learn your field, live in your community, learn your community and do what you love. Good papers and bad papers take the same amount of time. They take the exact same amount of time. So you need to choose projects that have real upside. Okay. Cause you're going to spend the exact same amount of time on them, but one of them is going to have positive net benefits and the other is not. And then this is what Mark used to tell me. All you can do is write the best paper, on that topic. That's, a, that's such a Mark Hookstra thing to say. It's like, it sounds like he's going to say something's kind of like nice, you know, and instead it's this impossible statement. You know, that he's not saying write the best paper you're capable of writing, which is kind of that John Wooden philosophy in a way. No, he's, that's not what he says. See, because Mark is talking about this competitive greatness. All right. Write the best paper on the topic, right? Whatever you're going to work on, make your paper the absolute best paper that has ever been written on that topic. Now, you're not going to hit it every time. But in my opinion, if you make that the goal, your papers will be better than they would be if all you did was say, do your best, okay? You can control the inputs. You really can't control a lot of the outputs. You don't set out to get top fives, right? You set out to write the definitive paper on a, on a subject. There's a lot of randomness after that, good and bad. How do you get tenure, all right? This is just my opinion, all right? Every department is different. Every junior faculty is facing a unique, a unique situation. Even within the same department, they're facing a unique situation. There, there's a sense even which two people hired at the exact same time are not facing the same incentives in the same situation in the same department, okay? So just keep that in mind. You're gonna have to figure it out yourself. There's a degree to which you're gonna have to figure out your situation, not just someone else's, all right? So talk to faculty, go to lunches, get to know your colleagues. I, I never would go to lunch with my colleagues. I never would. I had an excuse. Uh, ever since the eighth grade, I skipped lunch, saved my lunch money, and bought comic books with it. I've not eaten. A, I used to. I hadn't eaten a lunch in like twenty years. So every time they would say to go to lunch, I just worked through lunch. I was just a workaholic. Um, now I eat lunch because I'm on Noom and it makes me eat three meals a day. But I, historically, I've never done it. Be curious, not judgmental, towards your department. Right? Just pay. Be curious. Be have that kind of curiosity about your department, about your colleagues. Listen and learn and observe. Make your own mental maps of the department. Don't be judgmental of it. The only reason that you don't be judgmental of it is not for some kind of like I'm I'm I'm, I'm beating you up about it. Is because it's not helpful. It's not useful to be judgmental in that sense, right? It's not useful. You've got to have a level of curiosity about why that department is structured that way. It may not be the right department for you, frankly. Okay. Most of us, and I hesitate to say this, okay, but I want to just put this out there as a possible idea. Most of us are price takers inside our department, at least when we're junior. Okay. The culture, let's just say the culture, right, of the department is a largely exogenous. Many of us, you know, many of us succeed in a department that is exogenous and we do not necessarily change it. We change it at the margin. Okay. And inside that department are a bunch of invisible rivers and traps. Think back to Finding Nemo. I always thought this was kind of cool in Finding Nemo where the turtle uh, sees that, where the turtles are swimming in that river inside the ocean. I always thought that was crazy. I was like, you mean there's rivers inside the ocean? And, you know, the thing is, like, you want to get in those rivers and, you know, if you're trying to go where they're going, and then you don't want to get in those rivers if you don't want to go where it's going, okay? So know where those rivers are. They're invisible. Be observant. Find them. Find the traps and avoid them. 
Okay, be careful. You got to write six articles in six years. Here's something I did not know in graduate school. I did not know the journals were different. I thought six articles in six years meant six published papers in six years. That is not what it means. Top fives, worth a lot. Top fields, worth a lot. And so your department values each of those articles almost like a menu. Right? And you go to a fancy restaurant like the French Laundry, that's the Harvard, MIT's, those six articles have to be, well, they, they at minimum have to be top fives, but they may, you know, everybody, everybody at those universities have top five. So really what it is, is they start saying, you know, there's six articles, basically, they conclude, yeah, this guy's the best in the world. This, this woman's the best in the world, right? That's the kind of thing. The mortals, though, the mere mortals, we're looking at department, and you need to figure out they need four JHR equivalent articles. Figure that out sooner than later. Figure it out. Um, but always remember, the thing that is worth the most is the stuff you care about. That is where, that is what you will get out of bed in the morning to do, okay? The good research that you care about is what will get you out of bed in the morning. So that's what you have to work on because you really can't control the rest of it. So work on the stuff you love. You're going to need to find sponsors in your department. There's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. You really need both. Mentors give you good advice. I had, I had, I had no shortage of mentors. I had Chris Cornwell. I had uh, other, I had colleagues, you know, at other universities who I just listened to and got advice from, uh, you know, Melanie Goldie. University of Central Florida. I would talk to her all the time. Christine Durrance. I would just talk to them all the time and just kind of compare notes and get advice from them. You know, so get mentors. They don't have to be in your department. What does have to be in your department is a sponsor. Melanie Goldie could not vote on tenure for me. Christine could not vote on tenure for me. What is a sponsor? A sponsor uses her social capital in the department to fight for you. She goes on her own initiative and has meetings with people and advocates for you. Okay, find them. It's a two-sided matching problem. You might have to guilt trip some people. <laughs> I mean, you, you might have to. You might have to say, I need you to fight for me. I need you to show up. I need you to be a better sponsor than you're being, right? And if you are a faculty member, you've got to be a sponsor. You cannot be this passive faculty member that just lets people just get chewed up by the machine. You're going to have to fight for them. That's what it means to live in community. The other thing, though, is you need to figure out your preferences. We were always told to get tenure on the market, not tenure in the department. And the reason was because if you got tenure on the market, you would get tenure in the department, but not the other way around. You want to have outside options and getting tenure on the market gives you outside options, can increase your wage, may increase your mobility. You need to network. You need to get those outside letters. So it's important that you're doing work that gets people's attention. You need to go to conferences. You need to be presenting. You need to be brave. You've got to be brave. You got to be socially appropriate, but you need to be, you need to have courage. And last, you need to swing for the fences. Do not be afraid of failure, right? Swing as hard, aim for, you know, per, a certain part of, uh, you know, the, the bleachers and swing for it. Okay. That means ambitious projects that may fail, right? Now doing it tenure track is obviously very risky and get some advice from other people, but I do think, honestly, I really still do believe at the end of the day, it is not a bad thing for you to be ambitious. Here's some tenure hacks. Uh, you get tenure based on three things, research, teaching, collegiality. It depends on which university you're at, how those things are weighted. At some universities, the weight is you know 1.0 on research, zero on these two. At Baylor, it was 0 .55, 0 .35, and the, or it was 0 0.55, 0 0.45, 0 0.1 collegiality. This one right here is kind of the shady one because this can, you know, in some universities, this can be how they discriminate against people. I had a colleague, or not in the economics department, but I knew of a person where that was the fudge factor. And they overrode all of this stuff by just simply being they didn't like the person. But here's the deal. You know, it's a culture, it's a community, and if they don't like you, they don't like you. And, uh... I remember seeing my therapist at once and I was like, I don't think, I don't think they like me. And I remember him saying, why would you want to be somewhere where they don't like you? And I would be like, well, you don't understand. This is how academics work. I mean, this is the department. He goes, why 
would you want to be somewhere that the people there don't even want you there? Why would you want to be in a relationship when the other person doesn't like you? You've got to have your self-respect. Screw them if they do not like you. Screw them. They don't, you know, they don't deserve you. That's the facts. They, they don't deserve you. All right? You don't have to be judgmental about it. You just can, the, the, if, they don't, if they don't see how perfect you are, and that's what it's coming down to, well, glad you learned it now, then later, right? So you get, teach, you get research based on these three things, though. What can you do? I remember, I remember early on in my, when I was a junior, in my third year, this, this guy came and spoke at this like, little faculty development thing I did. And he said, um, he said, you know, research teaching collegiality is how you get tenure. You, what's impossible about that? People always say, well, how do you balance? How do you balance these? And he said, they're intrinsically unbalanceable. You could spend all of your time on research and not be doing enough, let alone be spreading it. So all you can do is bundle them. And so when you bundle them, you make them compliments. And when they're compliments, any effort you spend on one of them raises the marginal product of the other. Okay? So it's kind of like if you need to fix your car, uh, you need to spend time with your kid. Right? You, you need to fix your car. You need to spend time with your kid. What could you do? Right? Ordinarily, those are substitutes. Every second you spend on the car, you're not spending with your kid and vice versa. Why don't you have your kid come help you on the car? Why don't you have your kid bring, bring her toys and sit you know, safe distance from the car while you're working on it? You just talk to her. Right? There you're doing both. So you could teach your papers. Right? You could co-teach a class with other faculty. You could teach their papers. You could teach classes in your field. That's what I did with causal inference. I, I decided I'll teach a new class. I need to know causal inference. Every second I spend learning this stuff is seconds I'm not spending developing my classes. Besides, I don't think I'll master it if I'm just learning on my own. So I'll teach a class on it and force myself to master it. The fields and the methods are changing so fast. I feel like I can't keep up. How do I keep up? That is a common feeling. That is a very common feeling because, you know, feel, it, it, it's almost like that's a good sign. Almost like it's a good sign. It probably shows that you're being productive be honest because you're focusing on your work rather than just reading everything i just I, I just am a genuinely curious person and i love econometrics and i love learning econometrics and the thing is econometrics is necessary for my research so i love to do it and i love to see what other people are working on so how do you keep up you know i think that i'm trying to help other people coachella my Substack. a lot of people are doing these online seminars covid has been really cool uh, for academia, you know, as tragic as it's been, cool, that's not the right word. Co COVID has had some disruptive innovations, let's say that, some creative destruction. And one of them is the creation of the online seminar. Any of us can now peek in to a seminar on Zoom. It's a way for us to keep up. Econ Twitter can be helpful. Other things can be helpful, okay? Having research groups, having reading groups, keep reading, keep studying, try to find joy in the process of learning again. Right? Don't beat yourself up because you don't know something. See it as an opportunity just to learn something new. It's not a bad thing to be the least skilled person in the room. It's a gift to be the least skilled person in the room. Why? Because you, you can't get any dumber. You can't get any dumber. All you can do is go up. All right. So being around smart people and trying to learn from them. And honestly, there's going to be people in the room that are going to be perfectly fine and happy to help you. Selling your work, uh, it's a two-sided matching problem. Nobody knows you. You need to go first. That's a really big deal to me, you know, is going first. You think that the world needs to be a certain way. Go first. Be the first one. You, you step out in courage and do it. So you're going to need to sell your work. How do you do it? You need to advocate for your work in an appropriate way. Put yourself out there. Tell people you're going to be in town, right? You're, you're coming. I remember Jason Fletcher one time. Uh, was going to be presenting at the University of Texas, Austin. So he just called me and said, hey, I'm going to be coming through. Can I come by and present at Baylor? And I was like, sure. You know, we don't have to pay for him, right? Tell people like that. Network. Find ways to own the process of distributing your work, okay? Don't be passive about it. Put yourself out there. Be brave. Have courage. Be socially appropriate. Be curious. Listen, but put yourself out there. Nobody knows who you are. So you're going to have to own that part of the property right. And I recommend you learn the skills of expert speakers. Find your own voice, continue to improve, but pay attention to what makes certain people really good. I remember, oh gosh, dang it, I can't remember his name. It's that urban economist at Harvard. He um, presented at the Southern. Man, he was incredible. 
He was like the keynote speaker. That gummit, what's that guy's name? Well, anyway, he gave this presentation, and I was like, in a million years, I couldn't do that. Or Larry Lessig, right? Those famous black screen talks he gave. Pay attention, you know, watch those people. You probably aren't going to do that, but it's cool to sort of look and emulate and kind of figure out your voice of speaking. So here's my concluding remarks. These are just things I think about. And I'm, I'm not a guru. I'm just saying that these are things that I think about. But the main thing that I want to say is you need to be protective of your mental and emotional health. You need to make good friends and you need to be a good friend. I have not always been a good friend. Uh, for a long time, I think I was not a good friend. I was a consumer of friends, but I wasn't a, I wasn't a great friend back. I think it affects your research and I think it affects your success, even if I can't articulate it. Learn your production function. Learn about how to create ideas. You know, are you an idea? You know, ultimately papers come down to all these things. Ideas, data collection, writing, knowing when to quit a project, knowing how to cut bait on a project is a skill, right? Seeing it through the publication process, seeing it through the refereeing process, the grinding away. When you find good co-authors, protect those co-author relationships at all costs. My, my long-term co-author relationship is Manisha Shaw. Absolutely, 100%. She's one of my favorite people in the whole world. I see her like a sister, but we have been productive together. She somehow we just have this interlocking positive non-toxic relationship. It's just like a jigsaw puzzle piece. I bring the best out of her, I think. Well, I know she brings out the best in me. I don't know what I do for her, but I definitely know she brings out the best in me. Those are key to long-term success. All right. Remember all the two-sided matching stuff I said in the search cost, finding others key, go to conferences, present, be engaged. Take people out for tacos. Have fun. Don't forget why you got into this. Continue to be inspired. Thank you and have a good day.